What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Well, that's the question that we're looking at in today's daily devotion. I'm Pastor John Blevins. It's Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. And I'm thankful that you're here with us for another devotion. Let's dive right in. Let's hear from God. As we turn to the Bible, the New Testament, to Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew 16, we're going to read verses 13 through 23. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord! This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is one of a few of the study passages that are down in the description below. The study passages come together. They give us our theology portion which also helps to answer this question, what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? So we're going to turn to Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 30, section 2. To these officers, the keys of the kingdom of heaven are committed, by virtue whereof they have power, respectively to retain and remit sins, to shut that kingdom against the impenitent, both by the word and censures, and to open it unto penitent sinners by the ministry of the gospel, and by absolution from censures, as occasion shall require. Now expand upon this a little bit. We're going to turn again to to Chad Van Dixhorn's book, Confessing the Faith, as he looks at this very question, the keys of the kingdom. Van Dixhorn writes, The focal point of church government is the power and exercise of what Jesus called the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Here in the confession is picking up language used in Matthew 16 where the keys of the kingdom are mentioned in the context of the preeminence of Christ. Before all the disciples, Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ and the Son of the living God. Our Lord commended him, and with a word play on Peter's name, which means rock, he promised, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew 16, 13 to 18. It is a passage that underlines the government of Christ, his power and rule over the church. Famously, it is also the passage where Jesus goes on to declare to his disciples that they would be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, Jesus says, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, Matthew 16, 19. Jesus gave these keys in Matthew 16 to his disciples and in them to the governors or officers who rule his church. Church officers are given the task of binding and loosing or retaining and remitting sins, making judgments as to whether sinners are impenitent, unrepentant, and bound by Satan, or penitent, repentant, and freed for Christ. The same truth was taught again by our Lord, recorded only two chapters distant in Matthew 18. There Jesus was again speaking with his disciples, this time giving instruction about church discipline. At the end of the discussion, Jesus announced, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 17, 18. 
On yet another occasion, recorded in John 20, 23, Jesus told his disciples, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. John 20, 23. The message of these three passages is astonishing. It seems to be the plain point of these pronouncements in Matthew 16, 18 and John 20 that it is the responsibility of church officers to judge by the word of God as far as is possible who is going to heaven and who is not. Church governors have power from Christ respectively to retain and remit sins. The elders of the church guide the body of Christ in determining whether someone is to be treated as a brother, as an erring brother, or as what Jesus called a Gentile or tax collector. The elders shut that kingdom against the impenitent, both by the word and censures, and to open it unto penitent sinners by the ministry of the gospel. Sometimes, as occasion shall require, we leaders must preach stern words and exercise real discipline. Sometimes, as occasion shall require, we must open wide the kingdom by preaching the gospel and offering release from correction. Officers offer what the Westminster Assembly calls absolution from censures and what the Apostle Paul calls a turning to forgive and comfort, 2 Corinthians 2.7, also verses 6 through 8. Even the most godly church officers are by no means perfect, as we all know, but they are appointed as gatekeepers who, as occasion shall require, sometimes shut the kingdom on Christ's behalf. They do this by the word and by censures. The preaching of the word alone lets some people know where they stand before God. The reading and preaching of the word is the most commonly applied tool of discipline, for it convicts us of sin and drives us to repentance. Usually this is enough for us. Sometimes we need the censures of the church to have matter matters further clarified for us. Practically, this means that when the officers of a church examine a person for membership in the church, they are making an extremely important decision. They need to decide whether or not they will give someone the assurance that in their opinion, all is well with their soul. And when the elders travel a long way down the road of church discipline, they often have to ask hard questions. Does this person's life and testimony so contradict the word of God that they must be put outside of the church and excluded from a present hope of heaven? This should carry real significance for the members of the church. If you are a member in good standing in the church of Christ, then this is material for encouragement. Those whom Christ has appointed to look after your eternal welfare have come to the conclusion that there is sufficient reason to think that you are on the narrow road of God's kingdom. And if, on the other hand, the eldership of a church admonishes a member or suspends them, disciplines them, or excommunicates them, that member should consider the reasons for such actions with the utmost gravity and once the matter is made public, every other member must be in prayer for that person incessantly. Well, you may have noticed we've entered a new mini-season as we're looking at church censures. So we'll have this for a few days. And, and I know it'll be a, a benefit, encouragement, blessing to you as much as it is to myself. Praying that the Lord will use it. Until then, may our great God bless and keep you.